Hey guys, Ben on Ben's World website, Ben's World Postman Production, Google them, you get me. Um, I've just turned around and on, I, on the bottom of this link, I've given you a, uh, I've attached a, an article. Uh, basically, I'm giving you the background information there for three um, significant events which I've found in my research of recent. The first one's very, very straightforward. It's, it's simply uh, GNS is telling is not reporting earthquakes. So, for example, when you look at White Island, they're told there was a 5.5 earthquake, uh, I think, on January the 4th. Um, in actual fact, uh, as a, a local source pointed out to me, uh, he referred to me other city monitoring, that had actually hit up to six earthquakes on that particular day. Um, and whereas the day before they said there was none, well, we, again, that that's not true at all. Um, interestingly, since we've been having those conversations, it has been pointed, uh, Genius has turned around and said, oh, you know, we've lost some of our, our deep sea moors, and there's a lot of interest on in investment market about um, these deep boys and there's the focus is on the deep on, on deep is what we're getting at um, but it doesn't really it doesn't actually ring true because it, while some of those earthquakes are deep a they've been picked up by other monitoring seismic monitoring services uh, B a lot of them actually aren't the GNS has actually become part of the uh, Prime Minister's office so they've become incredibly politicalized and I imagine that's a lot to do with um, the seismic activity affects things like insurance and, and investment issues so they're trying to downplay that but it is interesting that where the people that are paying attention to this are actually overseas india china and it's papers that are normally aimed at a business demographic whereas uh what we're getting here locally is very much being under reported uh that one island also one also took place at the same time as recent dolphin strings quite small compared to what we've seen um uh, however, we've you know we've seen it happen enough in Christchurch, the two Christchurch earthquakes, uh, in Indonesia for that correlation to be very put together. I've been trying to find the guy online, the Russian scientist. He, he was this, he was the head scientist for Project Vulcan, Project Mercury. He would also done a lot of that work. That stuff just seems to have disappeared. I mean, I'm looking, looking, but I can't find his name. I I can find names of people who write about him, but they don't identify him. And and, and it's interesting because again, that dolphins earthquake seismic ring that seems to have been filtered off the net as well. Make of that what you will. Uh, standard observation, which is not made as a geologist, just seeing what we're seeing. We were noticing that all the uh, deep uh, quakes were occurring on the um, east of the pl on the plate. Um, again, go and check that yourself. Again, like the, it's on the website, you can so check that out yourself and then go and do your own research. Um, and that's sort of towards your chilly area, and the ones that were shallower on the west hand side. Now, it, it, putting that out in question is the correlation that was I was talking about to my source was that uh, I've been keeping an eye on, on uh, Puerto Rico, um, which was getting a whole bunch of like a, a swarm of quakes, which is what we're sort of seeing around White Island, but not still on the same scale. They were very light, though, within the six to seven kilometer range. Um, and uh, Puerto Rico is based on the geology, which has got a kind of continental drop, drop which is, you know, it was highlighted during the Haitian earthquake, which is Puerto Rico sort of right next door there. Um, and same with some of the Japan. So the that the um, the issue of basically that that dropping off in depth has it's got the same geology as New Zealand. So I was sort of looking at that, saying, well, actually, that's the area which I reckon was more likely to get hit next, because the unlike these other ones we've seen, which were deep, these were very shallow, which is normally ones that you have to be worried about. Um, Boom on cue as I'm writing this all up last night. There was a, uh, a mudslide and, and a very large earthquake in about in the six plus range, um, and that was triggered off. And of course, you know, in this whole thing, I keep saying to people that, you know, what I look at from my training is that I go and I look at an area where something's happening and all the anomalies, and then I pick up the rock and I go, oh, look, there's uh, Puerto Rico, the, the uh, Arecibo ionosphere, which is, you know, a heart based technology. Uh, another case of each time we pick up the rock, we're seeing the same hardware. Uh, most of the, the harp stuff is actually constructed by BAE. The same technology, the same personnel, the same money trail. So that that's that's where I'm coming from, which is outside the discipline of atmospheric science or um, a geologist. And the geologists that also need to run, you know, they say they get all very, oh no, that's not happening. And then as Kaikoura proved when I turned around said there's no full moon, um, the astrophysicists turn around and say, well, actually, moon can affect the tide, and that's when GNS turn around and said, oh, we'll stick to our knitting. We wish they really would, and, and we also wish they'd actually give us accurate information and not be so politicized. You've got to understand that the GNS also receives large amounts of money from the oil and petroleum industry. Uh, very quickly, get to the next point. Um, 11th, I just mentioned that too, because the 11th, we've got a full moon, wolf moon, and we've also got a high tide for the west coast. So, again, just keep an eye on what's going on in that area there, because, as I said, it's the... Uh, 
the shallower quakes are happening on the on the left of the plate, the deep ones on the right hand side. In actual fact, the, it's it's in the shallow that we actually we what we worry, and at least that's been my anecdotal observation. So I'm not speaking as a specialist when I make that last remark. I'm simply speaking as from what I've done is been you know watching the subject for about six or seven years, and um, I am trained to be an observer and researcher. So take that from that point of viewpoint. The second issue is however much more interesting was that um, I, speaking to my source, also pointed out to me that just like the White Island 5.5, um, uh, which other seismic monitoring then got picked up by Genius, then reported in the media, so like six hours later, so though both the media were responding to other people on social media and then said, oh, we've got to be seen to do something, even though they weren't using the resources to actually find out information about. And we've got to remember that White Island is still an active volcano at a level two situation, so it should be within the media's interest to be focusing on what's going on there and actually looking and paying attention and talking to people, but they're not. They're, they're, they're largely following the official narrative and doing being good little doggies and doing what they're told. Uh, when I went to look at the White Island, uh, said, he said to me, like, um, the plumes went off, it wasn't half an hour later until Genius reported anything, uh, and then, you know, they had all the disaster, and I realised that the boat itself, which I've got to go back and add to the website at the moment, which is all the background history of the, the company that owns the Ocean Liner, but basically tied up with, with oil and petroleum interests, um, and so that's one aspect of it, which, which I already was aware of. So then I started to look at the passengers list, which struck me, the first issue I was running into was the passengers list wasn't following normal protocols, the meaning where they give you the whole list after a while, they give you a little you know, nice bit of oh, that guy works in so and so, and they live there. It was actually very interesting, because they'd only give you a little bit at a time, and they weren't giving you all, and they weren't giving you a comprehensive picture of how many people actually died, and oh, that person was missing, and then that person turned up, uh, and so, and when they did give it to you, they're like, oh, that person's not been saying, you know, they want privacy because of um, family issues. And then three weeks later, we forgot about it. Oh, actually, no, it turns out that person's a British national. Uh, but then, then it would say the British national worked for a multinational, but not which multinational. So going in and actually extracting a full uh, background vetting uh, profile on these guys was a lot of hard work. Uh, more than I'm actually used to doing, and as someone that in in one of my jobs uh, when I was in the Army Reserves uh, was in counterintelligence, was actually doing vetting profiles. This was like working against somebody that was actually deliberately making sure it was hard, actually, to get the information. That immediately put a red flag in my mind and made me look even dig harder and, and deeper. What I found, and I've given you the whole list of everyone down below, so I'm not going to get into the who, what, where, what. Uh, but what you basically find is that the bulk of all the people that were either injured or died uh, were little family clusters, and each of those family clusters, there's somebody that works within the petrochemical uh, industry, or they are strategic partners to the United Nations Agenda 2030 model, specifically dealing with the issues of transport infrastructure and tendering of infrastructural contracts. So in terms of you know, who gets the money and all that stuff. So it was very convenient if you're trying to lay out a particular profile for all those people to be on that boat. I think the one person that is worth mentioning there, however, is uh, Lisa Hoskins, who is uh, worked for Santos Oil Petroleum, uh, who's an, a, an engineer for petroleum um, exploration, along with her legal partner, um, Gavin Dellos, whose profile is, she hit his website and he's hit into a firewall. They won't let you see, find anything about him. But Santos Oil was involved in a very famous case in Indonesia, where uh, their drilling actually triggered off a volcanic explosion in Indonesia. Most of the media, when you read up, generally correlate that, yes, there was a correlational factor between that aspect of what they were doing with the fracking. Um, however, basically what Santos did was they threw an army of, of lawyers at it so that the up against poor people, you know, tens of thousands of people displaced, a company with absolutely no morals, um, so they're still fighting for that whole process, and that, you know, and Santos has got the money to just keep throwing an army of lawyers at them. It's an important case because if the Santos case actually takes is, succeeds, then there's a lot of other lawsuits out there in Indonesia which are aiming at the oil and the energy industry, saying, well, their, their activities are actually, you know, whether it's 3D or electromagnetic or fracking or whatever, they are actually stimulating the conditions required to actually cause seismic activity, and it's very important because it's also dragging a lot of this fringe alternative new stuff actually into the mainstream and making people acknowledge that this technology does exist. So one of the things I keep saying about 
um, you know, now people, you know, saying to me, you know, the same, same people saying, oh, no, you know, um, heart technology can't do that situation. Well, they've never bothered to do the research. They've never bothered to work out to do the science. And we're now at a point where we're the same newspapers that say, no, that can't be done, are running articles about the Chinese and Russian ionospheres and, and, and definitely saying, oh, these things are involved in weather manipulation and insinuating with a lot less um, background than you know, people like ourselves who have been doing for years. That, oh, no, these things might cause earthquakes. In fact... It's, it's a double jeopardy situation because back in the days of the Cold War period, pre-1995 perestroika, uh, Western media was reporting on Project Vulcan and which and Project Mercury, which I think one of them was basically conventional exposures, the other one was electromagnetic um, orientated, either we're otherwise talking about the link between the ionosphere and the electromagnetic spectrum connection. Uh, only when perestroika came about, we started playing nice. Now, the reality is, again, is that when you look at things like... Uh, the first use of the stuff in, in Australia in 1993, which was linked to the, um, go read a, an article called Harry Mason's uh, Bright Skies or Dark Skies, um, but it basically looked about basically, we'll call them NGOs, non-government organisations being involved in sort of research, again, Japanese companies involved in uh, oil and mineral exploration were the kind of key candidates that Mason pointed the finger at, um, but basically, once the government started looking at them, Australian and American government, that's when they started re really getting into the stuff becoming more into the open source. And a lot of their hardware was based on the former Russian military stuff. So, again, you know, when the mainstream media starts to turn around and talk about um, this might be a possibility, well, they were already reporting about it beforehand. And where do you think we got the idea from? Um, I'm just going to shut the door for a second. Okay, so that sentence was a big part of that one, which is actually have a look at. So that's my main point for this video, which we'll try and keep under 15 minutes. Uh, second aspect of it was these guys were all dealing with road infrastructure transportation, which replicated that where the fires are burning is where they want to put this huge uh, railway in, which also has to do with the Agenda 2030 energy, global energy policy. This has actually been replicated, what we're seeing in California, and the same situation in Christchurch, where the uh, Kaikoura and Christchurch have great squares, we have cleared out this area for a new highway to go in, which is, you know, it's great, pushes everyone into the cities, lets them use smart technology. That smart technology is actually driven uh, in places like Africa, a guy, a guy called Stephen Jennings, uh, Institute, head of the Institute New Zealand, which is Business Roundtable, a guy that funded John Key, uh, also the guy that largely did a good job of trying to basically um, make a lot of money out of Russia in the perestroika period. Uh, and these guys are basically driving demand up for the energy. That connects into the situation that also that what you're seeing is that a lot of these Australian, New Zealand, well, Australian trucking companies and companies coming to New Zealand doing big buy-ups uh, are actually part of consortiums because the same thing's going on in Australia. That takes me back to uh, one principal company, which is Kalal Investment, which has done, bought huge massive amounts of, of, of um, you know, bought up large in the last few years. Um, again, energy, infrastructure, water, all the things which are part of the whole uh, centralization of power and resources for the agenda 2030. Kalal Investment's got a very, you know, rich history. Everyone knows about 9-11, will know about Kalal Investment. Um, they're also partnered up with Lockheed Martin, and who's, we have at least one person on our boat list that's potentially light tied into that doesn't matter whether he knows he's not uh what he's what that whole connection that might talk about kind of gives you an idea about what Lockheed's up to anyway and the fact that where the fires have been occurring in california begin with Lockheed's always been there from day one um and as we see profits occurring from all this new, new infrastructure moving into place bae Lockheed's the one that's always got the name stamped on the side of it um these are people that have been making large amounts of money before the announcement of what's happening in Iran beforehand, and now they're making even more from oil and um, Lockheed. Beneficiary of the war in Iran is Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is part of what they call um, the exit strategy, or supposed exit strategy from uh, fossil fuels, is the that, that um, Saudi Arabia plans to be the world's leading developer of smart weapons and by 2030. It's part of what they call Vision 2030. It's why Kamal uh, Khashoggi was chopped up into lots of those pieces because he exposed this. Um, that's part of that's from that is that BAE, Raytheon, Lockheed, who are all big players. I'll get into that last bit, so we might get that to 20 minutes. Um, but they've basically been working in conjunction with Saudi Arabia to make this Vision 2030 occurs. New Zealand and Australia and the Pacific have a big part in Vision 2030, the Saudi model, um, largely because basically New Zealand companies and Australian software companies are making the, are doing a lot of the work on the artificial intelligence programs, their software that's all been made, or not all, but you know we're we're big players in that. You know they're, they're our clients. Um, the 
specific is going to be perceived as from the pharmaceuticals and the five telecommunications that they see the Pacific as being an area which they can turn into a migrant workforce using the global migration to basically create effectively slave labour or very lowly paid way, way, uh, labour uh, and they'll make all the small cog components um, that will actually then, then will be turned around and um, used to you know for weapons that are made in Saudi Arabia but at the same time that, that industry will also be driving the deep sea mining uh, that Lockheed Martin is, is up to their necks in, and that's going to see Lockheed Mohair Peninsula is all around that trench area, which is hugely deep area, lots and lots of mineral and other resources there. Um, they're hugely actively involved in the Pacific moment, which has also been driven by the Australian and the New Zealand uh, government. Uh, in New Zealand, although the person was tested to meet Tamata, the High Commission, which I wrote about the fact that it was strange that Jacinda picked down chair specifically this 5G PNG security tie into all the security firms that are working things like the uh, Manus Islands Immigration Network, um, uh, GSG4, which is doing a lot of the privatisation security, emergency fire services, working with Suco, which is another one of Lockheed's ma ma mates. Um, so yeah, they, they were there, and of course Lockheed's also making huge tender contracts for the for the weapons being sold to the police in New Zealand because after March March 15, the mass surveillance technology they're doing the same in Australia. Of course, they're also driving all the you know they, I think they're, they're, um, Australia is something like the second largest buyer of weapons at the moment, and most of that's Lockheed and BAE weapons. So these guys are basically from making a huge land grab, but they're also developing this huge demand for their products by taking controlling policy for energy and infrastructure within this area, which all fits into this issue of the Agenda 2030. Uh, I'll end that note because I said, you know, I've really given you a, a super sharp, fast version of everything today. Um, but I'll end this note by saying that, you know, I, I'm having this constant thing, which I, I would like other people to pick up on, um, that, you know, we get very screwed when we talk about Agenda 2030, and, oh, there's no such thing as climate change or whatever. It really frustrates me because I see two people, you know, at logheads with each other speaking in the same direction. It doesn't matter whether you believe in climate change, what you know, whether you believe it's carbon sequestering or you don't. The point is at the end of the day is I've never met people on either side of the fence that don't agree that privatising your water, privatising your emergency services, um, placing corporates, you know, the biggest corporates in the world that have you know, largely created this problem in the first place, placing them in charge, making the, them the junkies in charge of the medicine cabinets is a good idea. We all agree on the same situation. The planet, the planet needs to be treated better than it actually is. If we do these things that they're not doing, the probability is that yes, the planet will be in a much healthier environment. So to turn around and have an argument about the the what caused it or what it's called, it seems to me rather redundant when the reality is the reality is it's here, it's happening. How are we going to respond to it? And the thing, the problem, the biggest problem I say about the, the United Nations uh, climate policy is that. It's not about making the planet a better place. It's not about fighting climate change. It's about centralizing wealth and resources. The UN makes this policy model, which is enforced by the International Monetary Bank and the World Bank, who then take it to government and say, if you don't do this, then we're going to you know, screw your credit rating or we're going to you know, not lend you any more money. And of course, they want they, they encourage them to, to build these projects and lend money because it makes them, you know, they have to do as they're told. But the reality is at the end of the day, the IMF and the World Bank actually draw their money or are financed by DuPont, Bayer, Nestle's, Goldman Sachs, Chevron, Lockheed, you know, all these guys. So you can take all of the worst names, corporate names that we all know these names and put them in the, in the go the words, Agenda 2030, and you will find they are the strategic partners that are shaping the UN's policy of climate change. So I, for example, as a general rule of thumb, having thought all about, I do believe in climate change, okay? I don't necessarily... You know, the, in the fires in Australia, it's not climate change is not causing this fire. There's 18, 19 different variations. I don't believe in simplistic models. I do believe that climate change is a factor, but that's not the point. The point is, how are we going to treat our planet and how are we going to respond to it? And these guys are the junkies in charge of the medicine cabinets. So when we're talking to people who believe in it, don't get all hot under the collar because we're all on the same page. Them trying to pick a fight about this is them dividing and conquering us and polarizing it. And again, when you look at the people on the White Island, it's interesting because there is actually even a person involved in there with behavioral modification. And when I turned around and looked at the fires that have broken out after March 15th, that sites that are used by the National Emergency Management Agency that may have had a link to, to the March 15th. Um, and when I start looking at the, the who are the, the actual offenders of, of arson and, and, and that are starting fires in Australia, you know, I find myself going into juvenile services of people that have actually got psychiatric problems, largely because they've been abused, because they have been controlled by families and structures that are, you know, not nice people. Um, 
it's part of that whole behavioral modification or you know propaganda aspect of it so we really need to understand they don't want us actually talking down and agreeing with each other they want us at each other's throats that's pretty much all, everything i can need i think i need to say uh there is probably something else to say but there's always something else to say and if i come up about it i'll come and do you another video but i'll try and keep these things under 20 minutes so that you can comprehend all the data i throw at you take care be safe don't freak out the universe is just going to want us to do the universe is just going to do what the universe does and that uh, nice to see you all